31st. We will start with um, the approval of the June 29th meeting minutes. Those were attached to the agenda. And as we always do, if, if someone could raise their hand to make a motion and we'll get a second, then uh, Dina will put up a vote. Okay, I've got a motion by Dennis Stryker, seconded by Ryan Hayden to approve the meeting minutes of June 29th. Any more votes? Okay, the motion has passed unanimously. Okay, thank you for that. And um, let's launch right into our presentation. Stephen, would you please introduce Andrew? Yeah, um, uh, hello everyone. Um, so today for our presenter, uh, we have um, Professor Andrew uh, Marginet. He's an assistant professor of uh, crop science in the crop sciences department at the University of Illinois Urbana in Champaign. Um, his um, work on the uh, phosphorus um, loading from uh, eroding stream banks uh, was a presentation that several members have actually recommended that we um, invite him to speak to us uh, on. Um, of course, we're working in an urbanized workshed, uh, a watershed. A lot of the um, work that Andrew's doing is in agricultural areas, but this stream bank erosion and it is a, perhaps a hidden source of phosphorus is something that is common to both of those areas. Um, so with that, we asked Andrew if he'd be willing to present his research to us and he was kind enough to say yes. So Andrew, if uh, that's a, a brief present uh, introduction to you, but if um, you want to take it away and just typically here we let Q&A go on as long as we possibly can. So uh, we're pretty, we usually have a pretty good question and answer session at the end of this. That sounds great. Uh, Stephen, thank you for the introduction and I apologize for the heart attack of joining a little bit <laughs> towards the hour. Um, yeah, we, we got you here though, so uh, and all's well. Yes, indeed. And I appreciate your flexibility. Last time um, there were some things that came up. So thank you all for your patience and uh, waiting for this. And I really appreciate the invitation to speak with everybody. I look forward to the discussion part, especially on this topic of legacy phosphorus. So um, my name is Andrew Marganot. As Stephen has said, I am at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Uh, tenure track faculty working on basically soil nutrients, biogeochemistry. You might be wondering then why a soil scientist is going to talk about water quality, and that's because the phosphorus, which is my favorite element, acts uh, uniquely in how it transfers from terrestrial to aquatic ecosystems. And so be these urban or rural or agriculturally dominated landscapes or not, this transfer will still be operating in watersheds. So because, um, the, because the behavior of phosphorus upon entering waterways uh, via erosion is very much dictated by how it is in soils of stream banks, I think soil science offers some insights. And to be fair, a lot of this work that you're about to hear is the result of uh, collaborations with hydrologists. So we work together with hydrology folks to make sure that we're piecing the two sides together. Okay, so with that said, thank you again for having me. Uh, the topic for today is what is legacy phosphorus and why it matters for Illinois water quality. So I wanna first begin by uh, acknowledging the funders of this work. Uh, what you're about to hear is funded by a slew of different organizations. Some are from our own state, uh, notably the Illinois Farm Bureau. They've been quite supportive of providing funding to get these numbers correct, as you'll see. Um, some on-campus sources like SSC, um, NSF, and then as of yesterday, officially, a new grant with Illinois NREC, which is the Nutrient Research and Education Council. Uh, it was formed in response to the Gulf Hypoxia Task Force mandate of decreasing our N and P losses in the coming years. So they just funded a roughly $900,000 project that will explicitly quantify the how much of legacy P in Illinois soils and stream bank erosion. And importantly, that second part is why we care about the buildup of soil phosphorus. So 
of course it takes a village and i want to thank these are the members of my lab that specifically work on just phosphorus and within the realm of legacy p uh, especially dr Zhou on the top left uh, she's been leading this effort and she's the phd in hydrology of our group that i check that i'm saying things correctly with when it comes to water stuff so the goal of my research group at the u of i we're about 32 strong is to look at nutrient cycling uh, this is everything from, as Stephen implied and said, agronomy and crop production to uh, native systems all the way into the biogeochemistry of water quality. And what we're trying to do is to, one, make sure we get accurate numbers on things like how much phosphorus is entering the surface waters of our state via different mechanisms and uh, pathways. So erosion, fertilizer, et cetera. And second, how can we then manage those biogeochemical cycles to have our cake and eat it. We all want clean water, as the expression goes, obviously. Uh, but there's a lot of devils in the details, I think, when it comes to phosphorus especially. So the goal of this talk in the next hour uh, before we have discussion is I want to try to convince you that we've overlooked what I think is an important pathway of phosphorus transfer from soils to surface waters in Illinois specifically. And this matters because it's not just a how much and that how much can be substantial. But it's also a how long until we see improvements in water quality upon implementation of best management practices, BMPs, be those overall watershed management plans or be those even in field practices by farmers like cover crops or reduced tillage. So the, uh, the, the unknown of legacy P is, I'd argue, a very big blind spot and it might hamstring and uh, confound our expectations. We may not see, for example, water quality improvement with respect to phosphorus loading for up to 100 years is one of the implications of what you're about to hear. Um, and that may not be anybody's fault. It may just be the way that this element behaves. Okay, so specifically, I'll first talk about legacy P in soils. Um, that's one, and that's the main definition of legacy phosphorus. Then we'll talk about stream bank erosion, which as Stephen has well forecasted, is the real pitch of this talk, is that it is an overlooked and undercharacterized quantity with implications for the how long the lag time. Uh, it is being defined here as a, it's a non-point source certainly, but it might be a non-ag source directly speaking. By this, I mean, it's not from fertilizer. Indirectly though, we may have modified, we have modified, excuse me, the hydrology of our landscapes through things like tile drainage and ditch construction. And indirectly that may have exacerbated in some cases, stream bank erosion. So I'm not claiming that stream bank erosion is has nothing to do with ag. It may be indirectly exacerbated by ag. There's also evidence from Iowa that things like tile drainage can decrease stream bank erosion. So it's complicated. And finally, I'll talk quickly about the other sense of the term legacy P of sediments. Um, this matters because it just refers to the fate of number two. When we erode soils from stream banks into streams, the soil persists as sediments now in the stream bed or the stream channel. And that's where we see also a different form of lag events. A good place to start then is if we consider what I like to think of as the Anthropocene. We're in the Great Acceleration. So after World War II, you see all these hockey-shaped, L-shaped curves of CO2 in the atmosphere is the common one, but population, fertilizer use, um, wealth, decrease in poverty, crop yields, everything is just going faster. It's accelerating. And uh, no exception to that would be phosphorus. And if you think about the world of phosphorus, this is from a paper cited on the bottom right. We can think of this as being pre-anthropocene, pre-great acceleration. Um, and it, the, the blue arrows are showing you the, the baseline, the non-human flows. And on the right-hand side, we have the anthropocene phosphorus cycle. So now we have the introduction of these orange yellow arrows. And note that these arrows are one bigger, they're fatter, so that indicates a larger flux, a larger amount of phosphorus. This is, by the way, a global summary. And note that most of these flows are going from phosphate rock. In fact, they all originate from phosphate rock. So we are mining these geological deposits of rocks, largely in Morocco and North Africa, where 95% of global deposits lie. 
and it's largely going into agriculture. There's some going for industrial use, but largely we have been enriching the earth with phosphorus by mining rock phosphate. This is a good thing. Um, prior to really 1940, uh, for example, farmers would go to battlefields and they would pick the bones of dead soldiers to grind up as phosphate. They were so desperate for pea sources. It's why not a single skeleton has been recovered from the Battle of Waterloo in Europe. Not a single bone of 30,000 men that fell that day exists because every bit was scavenged. So we no longer pick up bones. We now can mine rock phosphate. What I want to point out here is that the natural background of weathering from soils or into soils via bedrock, this is the net input of phosphorus without fertilizers is about 1.5 teragrams per year. It's just a very big number. But the uncertainty, if we add up as a balance what we know is flowing in from rock phosphate, what we know is coming out into rivers and into surface waters or into waste pits, the difference is a positive balance. So we have something being retained in soil and in water bodies that is 28 teragrams. So the unaccounted for phosphorus is almost 15 times the size of what is natural. So that's to give you a sense of how much we've engorged the phosphorus cycle, we've enriched it. Um, and some people have called this the, uh, the broken biogemical, biogeochemical cycle, excuse me. The point here is that the amount of unaccounted for phosphorus that is retained somewhere in soils and waterways before they exit our cropping systems is really big. And we call this legacy phosphorus in the soil or in the water sense of the word. It was inputted in the past and it's likely still there because as you probably know, there's no gas phase of phosphorus, so it's gonna stay there for a long time. Now, this is to give you a sense of the magnitude of the explosion of rock phosphate mining over time on the x-axis, uh, the megatons and metric tons of phosphorus coming out of rock phosphate mines. So basically after World War II, everything just exploded. And I wanna think about this in the context of where we sit right now in the former tall grass prairie ecosystems. Um, we, well, we sit in perhaps one of the few places in the world, in Illinois, where not that long ago, it was in agriculture. It was low population by indigenous peoples and there was not much ag. And in less than 200 years, we've gone from that to something like three fourths of every acre, including urban land, is being put under the plow. So 21 million acres of corn and soybean and some wheat cropping. In most places of the world that are now the most productive grain belts, like say Southeast Asia, uh, the, the Ganges, uh, the Nile Delta, North Europe, they've been practicing agriculture for thousands of years. So there is no natural reference point and the perturbation of phosphorus cycling has been going on for centuries, if, if not millennia. In contrast, in, in Illinois, we went from a, quote, background native cycle to a anthropogenic cycle in less than 200 years. So the benefit is, by the way, that we can typically with archive samples peer back into time, but that's a different story. So basically, we went from this really uh, pre-1850s, our state looked like this, um, more of a savanna with oaks on the knolls and uh, more saturated prairies on the bottomlands. And we've gone to this. So obviously, we've, we've impacted the flux of phosphorus. What's being added as a fertilizer is much bigger than what we had here. But also the flux is input and output. The output would be what we're removing with grain. So the flux has intensified. If the input is higher than the output, we have a positive balance. So phosphorus builds up in soil and that's what we refer to as legacy phosphorus. So a clear definition of legacy P in soils is the accumulation of previous phosphorus inputs into soils. And the same could be said of water, but there the input is eroded soil like stream bank erosion. This is to give you a sense of the uh, drastic nature of the land use change from a project that we have in our lab. Uh, 1845, as you can see, the major land uses, well, or land cover, excuse me, was simply forest and prairie. And then really by actually we find 1915, it stabilized to be the current land use proportions that we see by 1938 and even present day. So it wasn't a gradual transition from 1845 to 1915, 
less than 100 years, we underwent that transition. There's not much data on the intermittent period. So uh, it could actually have been even shorter than those roughly, oh, 90 years. So we're in the heart of the Corn Belt, some of the highest corn yields as a result of that. And again, it's a unique place biogeochemically because we've gone from native prairie landscapes with some forests to one of the most productive and ag dominated areas in the world in a very short time, arguably the shortest and thus the, mo thus the most uh, sudden transition arguably in the world. And one consequence, the reason why I think many of us are here is that we have things like this, where we have point sources in pink and non-point sources, largely ag, but not just ag, in green, neon green. And these, led, these lead to water quality impacts at local to regional to continental scale, the latter being shown here as the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. So I wanna talk about, um, actually I'm gonna skip over this one. Uh, I wanna talk about our losses from, from agricultural landscapes, that they're appreciable. The way that we currently calculate non-point sources, which we incorrectly, I would argue, conflate with agriculture, is we know the point sources and what they're losing. And roughly for Illinois, that's estimated to be 48% of our total peat losses. Now the other 48% or another 48% would be non-point sources. And roughly speaking, this is not NLRS estimates, it's from other sources, roughly uh, three-fourths of that is thought to be from erosion in general for cropping systems that are flat, like much of Illinois, and the other quarter would be non-point like runoff from fertilizer. So the 4% the would be what interests you. It sounds like urban uh, systems. The point here, though, is that um, non-point sources are roughly half of what we're losing to our rivers that is exiting the state. We are the number one contributor of phosphorus to the Mississippi River Gulf. Uh, or basin. So that's obviously a problem. We don't want to be number one. Now, because you can quantify point sources, they, there's an actual pipe by definition. You can get a good number on that. You know the total statewide riverine export. And by difference, you are assuming that the remainder is non-point source. And that's a fair assumption. But then it gets tricky to allocate or to just equate non-point source as synonymous with agriculture. The reason is that there can be other non-ag sources within the non-point, like stream bank erosion, which again is being defined as not directly ag, meaning not field eroded soil or not field applied fertilizer. That's my definition for this talk of ag. So the problem is that we can't quite distinguish within the non-point sources how much is actually ag versus or ag fertilizer or ag erosion versus stream bank erosion. Uh, to set the scene a little bit more, I want to give you some sense of context of what constitutes a lot of phosphorus losses. So um, you might think that we have a phosphorus paradox in the United States, but we have very high PU sufficiency in Illinois. This is simply a metric of for every unit of phosphorus as fertilizer that we apply, how much do we remove as grain harvest? And you want, in theory, 100% PU sufficiency. So for every gram of phosphorus fertilizer that you apply in the fall as MAP or DAP, that much you remove as grain, soybean or corn. So we have some of the highest agronomic PUEs in the world. Global average is 17%. Illinois is upwards of 80%. So we're fourfold above the global average. That's really good. And in the union of the US, we are uh, well above the Southern and Western states. So we're a leader in being efficient with their phosphorus. At the same time, we're the number one contributor of phosphorus to the Mississippi River Basin. So this might seem like a paradox. How are we one of the most efficient cropping areas globally and in the union, and yet we're a biggest loser? Um, no such thing as paradox, it's just bad explanations. We're not looking at it correctly. And I think that we can reconcile this by thinking about the magnitudes. So just to illustrate what I mean by we're high PUE, uh, we are in the dark purple, we're above 80% in much of the state. Global PUE, excuse me, I misspoke, it's 16%, not 17%. So um, the parent paradox, I think, can be reconciled and collapses if we realize that what constitutes a agronomically minor loss, meaning we have high agronomic use efficiency, 
uh, can still entail room for disastrous environmental magnitudes. So if we look at this map of HUC 8s provided by the USGS from Wisconsin, uh, black in the map would be very severe P losses. This is total phosphorus at the HUC 8 scale. Um, and this is looking at uh, well, point and non-point. They don't distinguish. So we've got these hotspots, which if we translate their units in the legend from kilo per square kilometer, um, these hotspots of 200 kilo per square kilometer is roughly 1.8 pound of P per acre, not P205, but actual elemental P. If you figure that a typical application in the Illinois Agronomy Handbook recommends you apply 200 pounds of DAP per acre, well, it's 40.5 pounds per acre. So um, the, to be a hotspot of losses, if every single bit of that is coming from fertilizer, which I'd argue it's not, but let's assume it is, that means that you can be 95% efficient in using those 200 pounds of DAP. But that 5% loss still makes you being, still has you being a hotspot of phosphorus losses. So even if you're say a 2% loss from fertilizer and the other 2% uh, is coming in magnitude from erosion, you would register as a hotspot HUC8 for P losses. So I want to show you that even if you're a 98% efficient in your P fertilizer use, there's still room within that agronomic, almost unmatched efficiency, which frankly, I don't think we can ever get to because of the complexity of cropping. Even with 98% fertilizer use efficiency, we still open the door for very big impacts on surface water quality. So this might be a way to reconcile that apparent paradox. Now, a question that might be raised is how much of our P fertilizer, sorry, how much of our P losses are coming from fertilizer? And there's strong evidence that roughly three fourths, and this is a very coarse ballpark, is coming as an average across the corn belt from erosion uh, versus from fertilizer that dissolves and runs off as dissolved reactive P. So if you look at, for example, qualitatively speaking, maps of erosion on the left um, and on the right, the P losses, they pretty much line up perfectly. Where it's hillier, you get more erosion in general with ag land use, and in general, you export phosphorus. There's a key theme here, folks, that is also important for stream bank erosion, and that would be that we have a lot of phosphorus naturally in soils. It's not always available for, say, algae. It's not soluble, but a typical total phosphorus concentration in the parent material from which our soils were formed in Illinois, which is LUS, is 250 to up to 500 part per million. That's total phosphorus on a milligram of P per kilo of soil. So it's not PPM on a liquid water basis. But um, for reference, in, in other parts of the world, for example, I've worked a lot in the tropics, in the Kenya, in Colombia, the country, um, total phosphorus on a good day is 150 part per million. So we have naturally high phosphorus soils. If you erode soil, you, that encumbers a fairly appreciable phosphorus load. So that would explain why erosion is a major driver of P loading to surface waters. Now, of the slice that is coming from fertilizer losses, a question might be raised, which is, well, how much is from contemporary applications? So let's just say the same cropping season. I apply fertilizer, and if I misjudged or slash I didn't really know there was going to be a rain event, um, and it runs off as dissolved reactive P. That's one thing that's contemporary. Non-contemporary would be what we're getting at with legacy phosphorus, which is someone in the past applied phosphorus. It wasn't removed by the crop with harvest and it's still there. Here's an example of why it matters for contemporary water quality. So this is a slide we have uh, working with Lowell Gentry and Dan Schaefer from IFCA in Douglas County. Um, and if you look at these historical images of the site at which we're working, um, we are monitoring dissolved reactive phosphorus that is coming out of tile drains that run from west to east and north to south into this, uh, into this ditch right here. And we looked back at satellite photos and we found in the red circle that one of the northern part of the field that we're monitoring tiles for had what looks like livestock holding facilities. And so we went into more detail and sure enough, these were barns with, we presume, pigs or cows. And uh, the soil phosphorus test, the Bray test, and part per million was maximally high 
right over where these barn structures were. I mean, down to like the five foot scale. And for reference, if you're above 15 or 20 ppm on a Bray test, you're not gonna see a crop yield response. You got plenty of P. And if you're over 50 ppm Bray P, there's a water quality problem implied. So we have values of up to 150 plus ppm where these barns were simply because of continued defecation and urination, largely the urination because phosphorus is in urine of these livestock. And if we look at the tile drains that were then, uh, excuse me, it's not sh uh, shown here, the tile drains that were then being monitored uh, that were right under these areas had the highest amount of DRP as a result. So this is to say that livestock being raised in these barns pre-1940, we believe 1950, had deposited phosphorus from their waste. And that phosphorus is still entailing increased dissolved reactive phosphorus loads via the tile drainage um, 60, 80 years later. 80 years later, excuse me. So this is an example of how past accumulation of phosphorus, in this case from manure waste, not from fertilizer, can still present water quality issues today. So this is an example of the lag time. Now, I wanna talk about le legacy phosphorus a little bit in soils because I think it sets the stage for um, this concept of soil phosphorus is really important as a driver of riverine loading. It sets the stage for the stream bank erosion. So. Again, legacy phosphorus is phosphorus from past applications or inputs that weren't removed. And so we have a positive balance. And this could have been from one year in the past. It could have been last year. It could have been 100 years ago. Again, phosphorus is not that mobile. It will leach, but not large magnitudes. And there's no gas phase. So unlike nitrogen, which is transient, we can't bank it in soils for years to come. You can bank phosphorus inadvertently, and it will be there for millennia even. Archaeologists use enriched phosphorus concentrations to identify where settlements were millennia ago, for example. So I want to point out that the relationship between PU sufficiency and P balance is inverse. So if uh, you increase PU sufficiency to 100%, it means that your P balance should go down to zero. This should make sense, right? You have a zero balance because what you put on, you remove, it cancels out. That would be perfect 100% PU sufficiency. PUE can go up apparently because you can be mining soil phosphorus. So you're using all the fertilizer and the native phosphorus. Um, and that would entail a negative balance, which is what we call mining phosphorus in agronomy. So the uh, P balance is inverse to PUE. The positive balance of uh, would entail a low PUE and thus legacy phosphorus. So we can monitor uh, PUE and P balances and therefore legacy P, the how much is there by using soil tests or by balance calculations. And I wanna walk through different pros and cons of these approaches. So the two main approaches would be uh, using an agronomic balance at different scales from field to state or using a soil test P trend. Let's look at some examples of these for Illinois specifically. This is a nice paper by uh, Professor Mark David and Lowell Gentry from 2000. Currently, we're working with Dr. Greg McIsaac to expand this going back to 1812 uh, when Illinois became a state. So a statehood, a back casting, and then going up to present day. So we're trying to expand this same exact balance. But what we know for sure from this study is that in the last few decades of their of their in the last decade, excuse me, of their work, they found a net negative P balance. So the net inputs are below zero, meaning that we're in a deficit. But look at the historical positive balance. Net inputs are well above the zero line of what we're adding into the state. So this is largely via fertilizer. Now to digest this, um, I've simply filled in, I'll show you that graph in just a second. I've simply filled in um, the positive balance accumulation as green, the area that is between the zero line and then the positive above that zero line. In red, we have depletion. So no, before we were using rock phosphate and fertilizers, we had a negative balance. P fertilizers are a new technology. They were not used before 1940s typically. So we were mining soils. Um, and then we are mining soils in the last decade, according to the study. But look at the massive magnitude of the net positive balance pre-1990. 
So we're mining modern soils, but there's a lot of green to draw down on to uh, basically uh, get rid of. Now, if you ask how much is, is this magnitude, they estimate about 2.2 uh, million megagrams, so almost 5 billion pounds of P as a historical mass balance were added to our state. Now, uh, to make sense of this, uh, I want to give some context for what this means. This is on average, if you assume 21 million acres of cropland, it's roughly 203 pounds of P per acre. If you assume that a 200 bushel corn crop takes off 30 pounds of P, this is not P205, but elemental P, um, that's about, well, many years, that's about 10 years of not having to add any fertilizer. But that's an average across the state. And you also might want to ask, or at least I do, um, what's the relative enrichment? So 5 billion pounds of P sounds like a lot, but how much do our soils have? Well, we estimate uh, with our assumptions listed down here, now we have roughly uh, 95 billion pounds of phosphorus naturally in our soils because of what I mentioned, the lusts from which our soils were born naturally are high in phosphorus. So down to the, you know, the top three feet, uh, this 5 billion pounds that we've enriched our soils in from historical past applications is quote unquote only a 5% enrichment of our soil phosphorus stocks, our natural capital. So a lot of big numbers. This is why I think context is important. Now, I'm not trying to dismiss that that's, that, that number might be in a form that is more available for losses. So that's where the catch is, is how important is that 5% enrichment, historically speaking, for what we're seeing? And the evidence suggests that it actually can be appreciable. We saw the example from Douglas County with the livestock and the manure and the tile drains. There might be slow leakage of this legacy P if it is more available than the native P. And we have reason to think that. Okay, and final thing, excuse me, is the blue is, is the riverine export. It begins at 1980, not because it was, uh, because we, we began to observe the, the uh, increase in the phosphorus loads of our rivers, but rather there's not much data. In fact, there is no data pre-1970, 1962. Um, and speaking with Dr. McIsaac, it seems like we have ways of trying to estimate coarsely prior to 1970s, maybe 1960 even, but we, there's just a lack of data. So this is not like we magically see a lag of accumulation to the riverine export. Uh, we don't know what the riverine export was with confidence pre-1970s. Okay. So uh, let's talk in more detail about how to quantify legacy phosphorus. We have sold test trends. We've got balances that are agronomic balances, fertilizer in, yields out, and thus the P being exported. And then we have um, really the P from past applications. So sold test P trends, just to summarize it, show that we're mining our soils in the last 10 years. Gray phosphorus is average across Illinois croplands with what that's consistent with what we just saw from the state balance. But what if there was a different way of quantifying soil phosphorus more directly? We have the good fortune at the University of Illinois of having an archive that is as early as 1861, but largely more like 1910 through present day. And these are a pet on scale. So we mean the soil profile to at least three foot depth. And we know where these pedons were taken. They are documented. Well, first they're stored nicely in jars like this. And they're documented in terms of the date of sampling, the location and the soil type and the depth. So by resampling these, we can furnish what's called a chrono sequence. If I sample a, a soil profile that was originally sampled in 1925, if I sample that in 2022, um, that's going to be I'm not great at math here, uh, about 97 years, right? Um, or 98 years. So that's, we can by resampling different ages of original sampling furnish a chrono, a time sequence. And we can see across time what the net change in phosphorus stocks have been in the state. So pretty exciting because this is one of the few ways, in fact, it's the only way to directly quantify legacy P. And we have full state coverage, as you can see on the map on the left. As a side note, we are looking for help with locating and getting access to these resampling sites. So if you 
see any counties here that you are next to with a red dot, we'd love to speak with you on accessing the specific location for this chrono sequence of 100 year plus. So 7,000 samples, 350 uh, locations across the state with actual documentation of phosphorus originally and the full pet on, on the right hand, meaning the different layers of soil. Now, here's a case study finally to finish the section on legacy P and how, how quickly we can accumulate phosphorus, but then have implications for P losses for centuries is the Mara plots. So the Mara plots, in case you don't know, is a treasure we have on campus. It began in 1876. It is the second continuous experiment, ag experiment in the world. And we have it right here on campus. A lot of issues with it, like statistical replication or lack thereof, but the value is that we can this year understand after 146 years of different treatments, like inputs of P, how soils have changed. So here they are doing the first sampling ever in 1904. And on the right hand side is our lab doing some deep Giddings hydraulic coring to one meter depth. And our question was to understand phosphorus balances in the Mara plots over 145 years. What you're seeing here is top line in blue fertilized plots and then the orange unfertilized or both corn on corn. So just think about that. They've been growing corn for 145 years every year with not a drop of fertilizer, we're still getting 20 bushels per acre, which blows my mind. In the fertilized one, we're hitting more like 250 bushel corn. And that gets uh, different kinds of P inputs based upon what was being used at the time. So uh, pre-1900, there's definitely no rock phosphate being mined. And then we have phase two with rock phosphate, then manure-based phosphorus, and then uh, DAP as the source. So we've got different phases. And note that the balance of phosphorus, either in pounds per acre, or kilo per hectare, whichever you prefer, um, skyrocketed with the use of rock phosphate. The U of I's official recommendations were to load up your soil with rock phosphate because it's very lowly soluble. It doesn't really dissolve. So there was a lot of recommendations in the state agronomy handbook of applying 4,000 pounds of rock phosphate, which is about 8% P205 per acre. So we see that there is a massive positive balance engendered in a very short amount of time. And roughly in 10% of this time scale, we encumbered the majority of our positive balance, i.e. the legacy P. And note that with the manure phase, we have slight drawdown, meaning we have a negative balance for a couple decades or several decades, but we had so much of a positive balance from rock phosphate, we're still drawing down. Then we had a another positive balance with DAP, and now we're still drawing down. Note that the unfertilized plot has a negative balance continuously. This makes sense. You're harvesting a crop, 20 bushels per acre, but it's still something. Uh, and so you're drawing down on phosphorus. So we have a negative balance of over 1,000 pounds per acre. So the takeaway here is that to, to complete the drawdown, meaning that you're applying less than what the crop is removing with harvest, to finish that drawdown back to our, our neutral, we want to use up the past applied P, that would take at this rate another 150 years, which is as old as the Mara plots are right now to return to neutral. So you can do a lot of, I don't want to say damage, but a lot of positive balance can be accrued in a very short time period. But this is a hysteresis effect, meaning that the way back is not the same way, same as the way there. So it'll take a lot longer to go back than it will to, than how you got there, excuse me. Okay, so that's legacy phosphorus in soils. I wanna now in the last 20 minutes transition to what this means for water quality, soil, soil legacy P, excuse me, but also the other definition of, of legacy phosphorus, which is the phosphorus that ends up by erosion of soils, sometimes with legacy P, into stream ways, into water channels like stream beds. And this happens through the mechanism of stream bank erosion, which as we'll see is not a direct ag contribution. Unlike the legacy manure P in Douglas County that is still leaking DRP into tile drains, this would be non-agricultural fertilizer or manure based application that is entering into waters by direct injection via stream bank erosion. 
So stream bank erosion, as I've just mentioned, is a quote, natural process. Maybe better said is that it's always occurring in the background, which is just like erosion off of hills. It's always though, are humans exacerbating the rates? And in the case of both, humans are likely exacerbating the rate of erosion. Long story short, there's all kinds of uh, shear forces and shear stresses uh, on the banks of a stream, which is, I'll remind you, soil. So this is where soil meets stream, where soil scientists like myself work with hydrologists. At the water interface with soil, you get lots of physical processes that as you might imagine are a function of how fast the flow is. Um, the curvature of the stream bank. More meandering streams tend to entail generally more stream bank erosion as they cut around the bend. Long story short, we are eroding soil. And as a result of that, the soil that contains phosphorus is going to contribute phosphorus to sediment into the stream bank. That's gonna be a problem because that will constitute a phosphorus loading. And depending on the context, depending on the water shed in the year, uh, we have found through meta-analysis that from six to up to 93% of total phosphorus export from rivers, these are from small streams, first order to large ones, um, that we can get total phosphorus loads um, that range again, sorry, from six to 93%. So in some contexts, minimal contribution, in some contexts, it is the main contribution. So I, I wanna give an example right here from Illinois, from East Southern Illinois, uh, from the Ember watershed of the, the complexity of stream bank erosion in terms of how much P and what kind of phosphorus. And I don't think we talk about the kind of phosphorus enough because there's implications for the lag effects, not unlike soil like UCP. Uh, so here we are in the Ember River. I think we're all aware of it. Uh, we went to the Whole cats, which is a tributary of the Embra, directly speaking, as uh, sh uh, shown on the map. We worked with um, Jeff Buckler from Northwater Consulting, and what we found from a stream bank survey, uh, as you can see, the red areas were hot spots of erosion. This is a qualitative assessment based upon visuals. So then we we sought to understand in these hot spots of stream bank erosion how much P could be eroding via stream bank losses. So for this, we then we went back to these hotspots, as you can see right here, and we sampled stream banks. To give you a sense of what it looks like, this area, it's right here. Uh, these banks are from as uh, short as three foot to as tall as um, about 25 to 40 feet. So uh, again, this is a close-up of the area, an ag-dominated watershed, but forested along the stream. Um, and this is to give you a sense of the sizes of these stream banks. I'm not very tall, I'm about five foot six. And so for scale, that's me. These are roughly from three, maybe four foot up to, as you'll see right here, uh, the guy in the back is about six foot something who's up against the wall, that's Jeff. Um, so you can make out based upon Jeff's height, these are pretty large, about 25 to 30 foot stream banks. Now what you're looking at here would be the topsoil, what we call topsoil. And then the rest of this would be the lust. This is this very same lust I've been yapping about. Parent material, it blew in after glaciation, hence lust. It's silt size, rich in phosphorus and in carbonates. And this is the native source of phosphorus in our soils. It's also what we're going to erode always when we transfer soils from stream banks into waterways. So that is to say, there's no fertilizer say in some cases like in this forested riparian corridor, but we will still have phosphorus being loaded as a result. Our question here was simple. How much phosphorus is being injected by direct transfer of P via stream bank erosion in this area? So to give you a sense of how we did this work, uh, we did soil profiling where we would uh, characterize different horizons, the A horizon, what we call topsoil, the C horizon, we found buried A horizons from alluvial deposition and burial. And then at each layer, we quantified the concentration of phosphorus. We then used the bulk density of the, each layer to convert to a stock. We also looked at the sediments that were already in the stream. And as we found, there is typically more soil phosphorus in the topsoil. We find though pretty high amounts of P content in the subsoil because the lust has phosphorus. 
And the stream banks had a surprisingly high, sorry, the stream channels, the beds had a fairly high amount of pee in the sediments, higher than what others have reported. Now, here's why this matters. As you cut the bank, you get what's called mass failure. This whole thing will then just collapse as you undercut the bank. And uh, to give you an example, in this stream bank, if you eroded uh, three feet length, six inches in from a mass failure event, so you get a lot of deposition, that would be 3.2 pounds of pee. Now remember, on an acre scale, 1.8 pounds, almost half of that, 1.8 pounds of pee per acre makes you a hot spot of pee losses. So three feet of a stream bank, if eroding severely, is halfway to on an acre basis a field being a hot spot. So if you're eroding hundreds of feet of these very small streams, we're talking uh, you know, they're maybe five to eight feet wide. Um, there's thousands upon thousands of miles of these streams across the state. If there's severe erosion events, this can add up quite quickly. And that's the question that we're chasing is how much can stream bank erosion in, in, uh, in aggregates contribute to our phosphorus loads across the state? This is an example of the five different banks that we looked at. Um, note the scale in centimeters. We have the five, almost six meter deep one that we saw, the very tall bank. Um, so they're all pretty deep. We went down to the stream water level in every case. And we did what's called a pedogenic classification. So different kinds of layers that we call horizons with letters. Long story short, we did a very careful job on a soil characterization because we wanted to understand um, are the current approaches to estimating stream bank erosion contributions to water loading accurate? Right now, people look at the depth of the stream bank and they assume one P content. Um, typically it's something like 400 PPM. And you can do some math on then how many pounds per length is being contributed by erosion of the stream bank. The problem is that as soil scientists, we know that as you cross these different layers, there should be differences in total phosphorus content. So using an average value may not be that accurate for your overall assessment. And when we measured total phosphorus content, we found that indeed there's sometimes erratic or um, unpredictable changes in P content as you go down the depth of the stream bank. This has to do in part because of deposition. So A's are topsoils. Note how we have two kinds of A's. This used to be the surface of the stream bank, and then there was probably a flood event, and we had a depositional event by as alluvium, which made a buried soil. So we see P go back up because typically P is higher in topsoils from litter fall of forest vegetation. In some cases, we have a slow decrease. Now, notice we go very deep. We're talking, you know, two to five meter depth. Our total phosphorus is still sustained at, in this case, 160 part per million. This is what I mean by we have naturally high phosphorus in our soils. It's actually more like 270, excuse me. So um, even if there's no litter from forest, there's no fertilizer, uh, including legacy phosphorus, we still find appreciable amounts of total phosphorus. Now this is total phosphorus. Um, if we add up the stock, which is you do the concentration, the PPM, times the density, you get the how much on an area basis. Uh, we can also look at not just how much total, but also the type of phosphorus. And this matters because soluble phosphorus will be immediately injected and registered as DRP downstream. And that's what can compromise water quality by eutrophication. But then we've got things like calcium phosphate, which is by the way, what our parent material of LUS largely has present as its native phosphorus form. So calcium phosphates is what your bone and teeth are made of. It's appetite, it's insoluble in water. And so this means that what we found, half of our total phosphorus is roughly speaking um, as appetite from one third to half, so calcium phosphates. So our estimates of P loading by stream bank erosion may be incorrect because number one, the total phosphorus and thus the total injection with erosion can vary drastically from 200 to 400 gram per, uh, gram per square meter. So that's roughly uh, 2,000 to 4,000 pounds per acre if it was an acre worth of erosion. 
So that's a twofold difference. And if we use one number, we're going to have inaccurate estimates of stream bank erosion loading of P. But second, the implications for water quality, immediately speaking, meaning annual basis, are dictated by the speciation. So soluble P, in fact, let me flip to this, uh, soluble phosphorus will come out immediately as DRP after you erode by stream bank erosion into the stream. Then you've got organic phosphorus, which is organic matter that has to hydrolyze it, mineralizes with bacteria or organisms in the stream bank. That's a slow release DRP source. Iron P, as it settles to the bottom of sediment, it'll then reductively dissolve. So we can have a slow release from a P. And then we've got apatite phosphorus, which is the calcium phosphates that I, that I just mentioned, which are very sparingly soluble. That might persist as sediments in the stream channel for, for hundreds of years even. Then we have this stuff called residual phosphorus, which is basically never going to be available. That's kind of good from a water quality perspective, but it also means that if we're doing budgets of P, we might, by not accounting for the speciation, inaccurately overestimate the consequences of stream bank erosion for water quality downstream. So it's complicated. A question that you might have is, okay, let's back up here. Just from a total phosphorus perspective, Andrew, how much phosphorus is entering into streams? So what is the non-point contribution of stream bank erosion? So a non-ag non-point. Um, and what we found from Iowa is that it's roughly speaking, not we, what Iowa has found, excuse me, Dr. Keith Schilling, it's roughly one third. So 31% is a conservative average and that they did not look at the smaller streams, which we know are typically net sources of P by stream bank erosion. So discluding the small streams, we're conservatively saying it's at least 31% of total riverine export as an 18 year average. Some years it's much higher, some years it's much lower. And this is again, it's the magnitude that's being eroded is in magnitude the same as what is being lost that year. Now, is what you're eroding the same in the year as what you're exporting? No, there's going to be a lag effect. So it's just saying that it's roughly one third in magnitude of what we experience as an export that year. Um, any guesses in the chat box from the group as to what that magnitude is like for Illinois? What do we currently think stream bank contributions by erosion are to Illinois riverine export? Any takers? Okay. Oh, I see one 50% from Stephen. Okay. Well, some of you may have seen this, so it may not be a surprise that uh, it's a trick question. We have no idea how much of our Illinois total phosphorus exports by rivers is from stream bank erosion. I'll say that again. For In the my defense, time. I didn't have one either. So, <laughs> oh, excellent. <laughs> um, so we have we we have no idea, zero idea. Why does this matter? Remember that we calculate non-point source by difference of total riverine export, which we can quantify. Point sources within the state, which we can quantify, and by difference, it's non-point source. But we cannot attribute the non-point source to agriculture because, as we've seen from from Iowa a third of their state export non-point source is from stream bank erosion. If those numbers hold for Illinois, we have, re we have reason to think that the number one is just bigger for Iowa, but we also have more meandering streams in Iowa. Then that means that a third of what we're saying is uh, non-point source is not from ag, it's from non-point source. And by not from ag, I mean, again, directly from infield erosion, and from fertilizer. There's a more complex nuance here because ag by tile drainage has modified stream bank hydraulics or erosion by stream hydrology. So there might be indirect impacts, but the point stands is that from a mass balance perspective in terms of getting it right, this matters because once we might be miscounting a non-ag source to ag from fertilizer. And number two, uh, to get it right, to actually decrease the loading, we should be thinking about what we can manage from ag via ag versus what we can't. And this is a big chunk of that puzzle. 
So here's an example of why it matters in the magnitude, what it could be like. Um, the way that you do the math here is that you look at your total er, the total eroding banks in the states, the recession rate of the bank, how much it's going in each year. So now you have um, with the bank height a volume, right? Three dimensions in space. You have a volume, the density is, well, how much mass per volume? So if you multiply this at this stage, now you have a mass, how many millions of pounds of soil are eroding each year? Um, and so for Iowa, for their numbers at this point in the equation, you have 16 million tons of sediment eroding based on their numbers. And then if you know, well, each kilo of soil has so much of phosphorus, then you multiply this out and you get how many tons? So Iowa uses 470 ppm. As I've just showed you, that number can vary vertically. And so the DAC weighted average might be different. And note that the speciation matters for helping predict the shorter term consequences for eutrophication and water quality impacts. Now, this is roughly 7.6 thousand tons. So that's, if we put that into the context of the Illinois NLRS, that is exactly, almost exactly the same amount that we need to reduce our statewide P losses by to achieve our NLRS reduction goals for phosphorus. Now I'm not saying that we can stop stream bank erosion because again, there will always be some in the background, but just to give you a sense, what Iowa thinks they're eroding and we're eroding at least as much we believe is same in magnitude as what our reduction goals are for phosphorus. So it's nothing to, to, to turn your nose up at here. Another reason why this matters is that there's interannual variability in P losses um, that we are measuring in terms of riverine export. And that might be partially explained by the annual variability in stream bank erosion. These are just numbers from Iowa where they find that uh, the high range of stream bank erosion uh, or the variability, excuse me, um, is about consistent with the numbers of what they're seeing each year. So basically, if you compare the magnitude of the uh, load coming from rivers that we're quantifying with the erosional estimate, they use one number here, and some years erosion could be in kind from as low as 11 to as high as 143%. And I'm being very careful because the point is that we don't actually know the, the, the lag effect. And this brings us to the sediment part of the presentation. So basically, when we erode soil from stream banks, it enters into water. As I showed you a few slides back, uh, you'll immediately solubilize a portion of the total phosphorus from the soil as dissolved reactive P. The organic phosphorus in soils will then mineralize over time, maybe days to weeks to months. The iron oxide will, will um, be reduced and will be released by reductive dissolution. So there's all these different lag effects, but there's going to be clay and mineral forms of P that are just going to sit tight and they will be in what we now call the sediment pool, the legacy P as sediments. So legacy P in the second sense that does not refer to say crop fields is what was eroded by stream bank or by overland from fields and is now sitting in the stream channel. Now that sediment can move over time and the tumble of sediments is very slow. It also can be impacted by things like dams or reservoirs. So in aggregate over time, it might be a long time before these sediments can hit the Mississippi uh, Gulf um, or that, sorry, that they can work their way down the Mississippi to hit the Gulf. We're talking decadal to centennial timescales. So there's some suggestions that it might take a hundred years for a particle of sand to having entered the Embora to hit the Mississippi from the state and then another hundred years to then hit the Gulf of Mexico, for example. This stuff though is very hard to quantify as is the total load, meaning how much sediment P is already in our channels. Final reason to care is that these sediments are very good at buffering. So if you ever get low amounts of DRP in the water, you will release DRP from the sediment and vice versa. So the sediments kind of work against us. They will work to buffer to ensure that we maintain a steady amount of, of dissolved reactive phosphorus in the stream. This is a simplification, but it's a mechanism that's been found. So this might also explain why in some years, as Dr. McIsaac just published last week, why in some years, places like, as he found in the Illinois River Basin, there is a unexplained spike in DRP. 
Um, there's lots of other reasons like floodplains, et cetera, but uh, the temporal variability of DRP loading and TP loading can be in part attributed to the legacy sediment that was injected via stream bank erosion, largely speaking. All right, um, so I wanna end with some implications here. The time scales of these legacy in soils um, in different parts of the landscape, as you can see conceptualized here by Jarvie et al, uh, we're talking decadal to centennial, even to millennial. And note that legacy P in soils by erosion is thought to be about five to 30 years. Um, we don't really know about the fate of legacy P in soils, and that's why our lab is researching this, um, is something more like we think up to centuries. When it comes to riparian legacy phosphorus, um, typically, we can have lag times of as low as one year in the channel as DRP to in the sediment part of the channel up to a thousand years. This is what I mean by the P that we're losing by erosion may take centuries to hit the, the where it's being measured. So the outlet of the state. Now, why do we care? Number one, the loading of legacy P via soils and in sediments can create lag times between when we do a BMP. Like, like trying to mitigate your, um, sorry, like trying to say, do conservation practices in the field, like cover cropping, or trying to apply less phosphorus to match crop output, or stabilizing stream banks. The legacy P that's there will be, will be slow release phosphorus. So there might be substantial lag times between when we do a BNP and when we see that translate to a water load. Uh, second is that we need to then, I think, quantify those lags because otherwise we may have incorrect expectations in terms of how soon we may see the BMPs translate to improvements in water quality. Now, I think since we're at time, I won't show this case study in detail, but basically uh, the Baltic Sea Basin had a similar issue. And what they found, the, the takeaway here is that the legacy phosphorus and stream bank erosion, even if you increase fertilizer use efficiency up to 90%, which is what Illinois is almost doing, will still entail phosphorus loads for the next 100 years because we still have backgrounds via legacy P in soils, mobile, what they're calling in red, and background what we're calling stream bank erosion. But I could go back to this in more, uh, in more detail if we got time for discussion. Final thing is that I want to put out the good news that uh, thanks to Illinois NREC for supporting this new proposal. As of yesterday, we've been officially funded to quantify stream bank phosphorus and stream bank erosion contributions at these Huck 8s, specifically on the map and across the state in the next four years. So we've got four objectives. Overall, we want to get the number that Iowa has that we don't have. And second, we want to provide finer spatial and temporal predictions of stream bank erosion contributions to total riverine P export at the Huckate scale across the entire state. So we're trying to uh, beat Iowa, basically. That's always the case I hear. Uh, but we want to obviously get more useful data and more resolved data to understand the within the non-point part of the phosphorus pie of our state's P losses. How much, how much would be from this source? So with that, I believe we've got time for questions and discussion. I would be thrilled to discuss this with the group. So thanks for your time. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. That was uh, excellent. Yeah, the um, yeah, it's kind of shocking the potential scale of something like this that was kind of hidden in the uh, the rest of the data set. Um, so, so yeah, I, I see if we're getting uh, anyone has questions for Andrew, please put them in the uh, chat. I will be limiting questions a little bit more as we've still got business to get to. Um, but um, Andrew, I, so I, I have a question for you. There's a number of publications out there looking at um, uh, you know uh, in streams uh, ambient um, concentrations of of various fractions of phosphorus. And one of the things that has been mentioned in a few publications is that. You know, in, in Illinois, it does seem that aquatic life can uh, tolerate higher concentrations of phosphorus than we've observed in, in other areas. Is there anything in, the, in your data set that suggests going back historically that the legacy P is, is perhaps, you know, higher throughout our area? Just 
extreme level of phosphorus. Stephen, sorry, I think you're breaking up at least in Yeah, Stephen, you, you froze on my end um, and broke up. But I think what he was asking, what he's trying, what he's tr getting at is that, I think and you sort of hinted at it a little bit, but do you think that ambient levels of phosphorus in our streams tend to just be higher than possibly some of our other states? You know, as we're looking at nutrient standard development, you know, some of these numbers are extremely low. But, you know, even in our reference reaches where we are meeting aquatic life goals for, for macroinvertebrates and fish, we're seeing, hap seeing higher levels of ambient phosphorus, you know, not in that 0 0.00 range, 0, 0 something range, but, you know, something in 0 0.2 and higher in some of those streams. Do you think that is attributed to our, nat to our natural soils being higher in phosphorus or? It's a good question. Um... I, I don't think we have data yet, but I would probably hypothesize that that's, uh, that seems to be higher than what unmanaged landscapes are. So I would say it's probably going to be due to how we've been using land. So I, I don't know if that's due to our natural, it's a complex question, so kind of. Um, <laughs> yes, because if that is coming from stream bank erosion, then in that sense, the actual atoms of P would be coming from what's already naturally in our soils. But we might be eroding stream banks more because of how we've modified the hydrology of these landscapes. So that's why I'm saying yes, but no. Yeah. Um, and in some places, of course, especially in, in other parts of the Midwest, like in Iowa, where they have lots of manure application, which our state doesn't, we're really different in, in that respect. We know that there can be over application of phosphorus, which I'm defining as there's more phosphorus added than what the crop can use. And that is a big liability. It's an, it's an agronomic bad practice. And we see this example in many Iowa watersheds with CAFOs where there is not great impacts on water quality. And that I think is a good example of, well, that's coming from uh, the input of phosphorus. Mm. Okay, yeah, that's good answer, yeah. Um, so then the, the other question in an area, urban watersheds like ours, obviously, uh, you know, we, we do have a um, certain amount of nutrients being added, but typically the driver for us would be the erosion rates, not so much uh, the input. So um, assuming um, that, I guess, number one point of that is, uh, what would your recommendations be for a group like ours and how to get a handle? on how to use this research to try to start picking out, um, you know, stream bank erosion as an input for an urban watershed. And um, I guess the second one would then be results, but I guess we should understand the problem clearly before trying to come up with a management solution. I would agree with that. Um, so thanks for the question, Stephen. I would say urban areas might be different in the sense of, from what I understand, there's a lot of, uh, flashiness because of the concrete jungle effect. And so there can be more attenuated and sudden increases in flow. And so based on that, one may have reason to think that there's a greater risk for stream bank erosion in urban areas or even suburban areas as well. Um, on the flip side, there also might be more resources to manage these stream banks. I've talked to a lot of people about this, people who do this for a living. And one way to, to mitigate uh, stream bank erosion is simply uh, to, to protect the stream banks. And so you can stabilize them by adding riprap, uh, boulders or concrete. Some folks even just concrete them over. Um, obviously there's a lot of implications. It's not cheap. We're talking thousands of dollars for every, I think 10 foot or 20 foot segment. Um, so that's not economically sustainable and ecologically, there's a lot of issues with that. One approach that Dane County in Wisconsin, where Madison is located, has mm -hmm. that has been used is to dredge these streams. So don't try to stop the erosion, just try to stop the slow release of the pea from the sediments. In their case, they did some dating on the sediments and they found that most of their sediments that were feeding the lakes were put down in the 1880s from moldboard plow with the initiation of plowing up the prairies. And we had massive erosion with the conversion of prairies to croplands just by virtue of how it was done and just that that's not a good transition erosion perspective wise. So in their case, they did the math and it was impossible to stabilize stream banks. And furthermore, their DRP leakage into the lakes was coming from the sediment. So they 
were able to pay and at the cost of roughly $14 per pound of phosphorus removed, they were able to strategically dredge some parts of these streams. So I bring this up because in urban areas, the access to these streams might be easier. If you've got yes. repair and corridors, um, good luck trying to dredge these streams at, at cost. Again, ecologically, I've freaked out a lot of biologists by even proposing this. I'm, I'm just telling you what I've heard yeah, from yeah, what and, people and, are doing. This is an area we often find ourselves where is, you know, this gets snagged up in the, yeah. um, well, you know, the phosphorus mass balance, but we're interested in the step beyond that, which is the protection of ecological life. And if you're, you know, it may be cost effective to dredge and capture phosphorus. And actually, I, I know a few folks at IWA had mentioned something like this. So it's interesting here, Dean County actually worked that out. I, they actually implemented that, right? Hmm. Yeah. So, um, but you know, obviously there are short, medium term consequences for aquatic organisms in those rivers. If you're, you know, we, we see that after high flow events that, you know, macroinvertebrate scores, et cetera, fall, which is a kind of dredging because of the mobility of those uh, uh, sediments under certain flow regimes. Well, um, I don't know that we did get uh, other questions from the group. This was, this was great. This was really opened my eyes to a lot of um, sort of things that were under our radar. Um, so I, I, we need to jump on to the rest of the meeting. Andrew, you're welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting. If, uh, uh, if you're interested, we're not going to be hurt if you, <laughs> you've got a, you got a busy day to get back to. But thank you so much for taking share your expertise today. Thanks very much for having me. I want to say that I'm happy to discuss with the group any questions or follow ups. Um, my email is my last name, marginot at illinois.edu. Um, and my research lab is happy to work with folks on the resampling of pedons or just talking about potential collaboration. So thanks again, Stephen, for the invitation and for the group for your time. I'll stick around for a bit. Okay, excellent. And anyone wants to get in contact with Andrew directly, if you don't have his email, he said, obviously, you can contact me and I will uh, get the, I will get his contact info to you. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Andrew. Thank you, everyone. I have a page full of notes. So uh, <laughs> I've learned quite a lot. I'm sure our members have too. Sounds good. Thanks, Dave. Okay, uh, Stephen, you want to? Um... Yeah, let's, uh, let's jump into the rest of it. So Dave, I'm going to uh, I'm not going to go through bullet by bullet. I'll direct folks to individual items uh, that are of importance. And then if, if people do have additional questions, they can either stick up their hands or they can contact me uh, directly in chat or after uh, after the meeting. And, and Andrew just posted his contact information in the, um, I think that went to hosts and panelists. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Um, First thing, just talking about MPDS permit special conditions, uh, the bullet set out everything that's happened there. One item I would like to point out is of great importance. September 29th, we are planning to have a special conditions meeting. So these are for um, agencies with wastewater treatment facilities. Um, the, that meeting is going to cover the sort of um, central mission uh, statement and methodology to get us to the uh, the goals of our nutrient implementation plan. So that is going to look at our, our modeling and um, how we're going to hit the, the objective set out by the IPS um, uh, total phosphorus uh, in-stream uh, toxicity uh, level thresholds that we're, we're aiming to get. Um, so we want to talk about exactly how, we're, how to formulate that and how we're going to um, uh, reach that objective and what that objective would look like as we would like to have it set out in our in our permits. I know a couple of entities have told me they can't make that date and we will be setting up a second um, a second date to allow them to um, to to review uh, to review that. Also had a couple of agencies which have mentioned to us that there's always outstanding items on echo. These are some DRSCW things but also a lot of other um, other uh, aspects of, of the plant. Uh, Dean and I will be meeting with um, IEPA some point after the, um, the 29th, and we'll also raise this item with them. It's just a, it's just items get logged on there that have already been resolved or have been, you know, have been completed. They get, they get put up there and then they never really get removed. And we'd like to see if there's some way we can um, work together to try to get the uh, a, a, a more accurate listing uh, on that uh, system. Okay, physical physical project update. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about Baywell. I'm gonna to try to share my screen here. You know, you work on about four different systems here and then every one of them is a little 
uh, different. Sharing? Yes. Okay. Okay, so uh, Thaywell Dam project, uh, as you know, this project has been on our books for, for quite some time. It is a technically quite uh, difficult project. Um, the, uh, and we are currently looking at the, this is, I think it was counting up yesterday, this would be, depending on how you account for it, the fourth or fifth different solution that we have tried to look for in, in this project. Uh, originally, we looked at modifying one of the culverts in this, uh, at this dam. Then we looked at modifying two of the culverts at the dam. Uh, there were some issues with that, with some of the structural integrity uh, um, uh, of this very important flood control uh, mechanism. So we, we backed off of that. We then looked at putting a bladder control system in that would allow us to manipulate the water levels around the dam and create a passageway through there. And we eventually resolved that, that we could simplify that by simply taking the, uh, the passage to allow the fish up into these various systems uh, and just place that in the culvert directly. And there was a, a brand new uh, type of, um, I call it a, a fish weir, but a, a fish laddering system um, that seemed to, to fit the bill. And we've been in working with that group for about two years now to try to come up with the design, uh, which we have. So we'll just quickly look at uh, the structure here. So this map is lying on its uh, side. So at your left-hand side, as you look at the screen, that is north. This is the west branch of the DuPage River. It's flowing south, and you can see Faywell Dam clearly noted there. Uh, Faywell, Faywell Dam is a, a vital flood control system on the west branch of the DuPage River. It protects um, downtown Naperville from um, uh, peak flows. So it allows, uh, there's various, the, the gates on this system can be um, opened and closed depending on the, uh, the forecast and uh, preceding uh, weather conditions. And that allows us to um, essentially flood this area upstream of the structure and so um, maintain uh, sort of peak water levels downstream of in Naperville at a level to avoid flooding. So this is the, um, the spillway on the structure. So there's a, a large earthing embankment runs either side here. It doesn't look earthing, earthen in this image because it is um, there is reinforcement on the back side of it here to protect it from overtopping. Um, uh, this is the uh, sort of splash pad wing wall uh, area. So we're looking upstream, looking north through the three culverts. And you can see here, um, if you look, so you see that dark area in the culvert to your right, there is a steep ramp there and that's actually where the fish passage um, blockage is. There's also just between those wing wall areas, there's also a, um, a, a lip, a concrete lip, which is also a potential uh, potential barrier, and, and we'll look at how we're resolving that. So this is on top of that structure. Now looking south, you can also see there's a riffle there, um, and that also is something that the project would be would um, um, is suggesting that with that that is uh, heavy riprap that has been pushed up by the flow out of the dam into this riffle. It's not a it's not a natural riffle. It's actually bed material. Um, that, was, that was placed on the bed rather in the construction of this dam to stop downstream scarring and over time it has been pushed up into this, this structure so it creates a little bit of a backwater here so as part of the project we would look to put that back to its original configuration and so drop water levels a little bit and that would allow us to increase the attraction flow flowing through our uh, post fish ladder. So this is what the upstream side of the dam looks like. Uh, you can see these are the three um, uh, these three gates open and close under operations of the structure. They never close. Um, our ladder um, would be on the one on the far left and it would hug that wall and then move through onto the, the wing wall here. Um, so the ladder itself would be in two pieces. Uh, the first piece would go through the downstream concrete lip. And then the, the other one would start as we moved into this um, culvert here on the far left. That's the most uh, Eastern of the culverts. And then it would, it would essentially, it would sit on a concrete base. It would run up through uh, the culvert onto the wing wall. And then there would be the exit point um, uh, for the fish. I, I don't have images of the actual um, uh, ladder system uh, here, uh, but it's, it's a, it would be a three by three um, uh, metal system. And it's got an in, internal series of uh, 
weirs and baffles, which then create eddies. And this has been very successfully used in the Eel River in Indiana uh, to pass a lot of the same families that we're looking at over similar gradients. So um, the we have a motion um, put in place today. And actually, just before I go into that motion, there's a couple of things that we're working through with DuPage County. Uh, on this project, we have we're putting in place a memorandum of understanding with them. This structure belongs to DuPage County Stormwater. Uh, the memorandum of understanding um, would um, uh, allow them to take on um, management of this. They would essentially put a bid out for the uh, placement of the ladder, uh, which we would then reimburse them for. We would be in um, uh, work with the the fabricator and the designer. Um, the, we would sign a contract with them, which would allow them to, um, to build it and then transport it to here and then over work with DuPage County Stormwater's uh, um, construction manager in order to get it put in place. Um, and then there would also be a follow up in the contract to allow them to, uh, to look at that it, it, that it was uh, functioning as is. There is a hinge section in this ladder, uh, which is one of the more difficult parts to manage, which would then allow those gates to be fully closed if that was necessary. That is done sometimes for to allow maintenance uh, at the structure, but it's not part of the ongoing operation of the, of the dam. Um, we had budgeted $902,000. Uh, you see this 902,380 figure here, um, budget. Um, what this motion would do, and with the executive board has authorized the staff to make this proposal to general membership, is that that full amount would be made available to the projects committee. I've set out there what the, the what that would entail. Um, we um, uh, the the ladder system itself, with all the design components and the transport of it out here, and the um, overseeing of being it put in place, would be the that two fifteen and two hundred figure. So it'd be about four hundred fifteen thousand dollars. Um, the, the placement, that is the contractor that DuPage County Stormwater would, um, uh, bid, would, would put out a bid for and um, contract with and oversee. We're, we're, that's the piece that's estimated here, but we've put an estimate in there of $250,000. And then in order to get all the permitting, et cetera, put in place for this, we reckon that that contract, which we hold with V3, would cost an extra uh, $65,000. There's a little bit of contingency built into each one of these figures, um, but uh, uh, but but uh, some of them have already been uh, negotiated, so we're pretty we're pretty tight in those. The one that I have the most, I say the most flex in it would be that placement with the contractor. I've got sort of quite wildly different estimates on how much that's going to be, but that's at the upper end of that that range. Um, these all total out to be $730,000, which would leave the project committee with $172,380, sorry, $172,380 in um, extra contingency out of that 902,380 uh, figure. Uh, in the budget, then, there is another $100,000 scheduled for next year for um, sort of you know, ongoing um, tweaking off the, off the design. Or if that was not necessary, that money would then get put into escrow along with whatever money was left out of this particular element. And that would go against the ongoing um, maintenance of the, of the structure, but also it would be emergency funds in case there was some unforeseen issue with, with the ladder interacting with the structure of the project, uh, off the dam, and we needed to, to take it out. So that money would be held in escrow to do that. There's also $60,000 in the budget ongoing in future years for monitoring so we can check to see that this is actually working. Um, while BK River Fish has spent, and I'm amazed at the um, focus that they have brought to try to get this, uh, you know, tailor-made and as, as close to mimicking the forces it's going to face inside Baywell as possible, this is obviously a higher risk strategy in terms of um, getting fish to actually pass. So you know the, the the removal of the bottom of the culverts was a high, was a uh, more expensive than this, but was um, would have definitely worked to pass fish. But it did you know there was a higher risk with the structure of the dam that way. So this is much lower risk in terms of the structure uh, structure itself, but higher risk in terms of of passing fish. But but in terms of fish ladder uh, technology, I think this is for this particular structure. This is is as cutting edge as as we can get. So the, um, 
the uh, vote before the uh, committee or, or before the general membership today is set out in, in your packet. And um, I'll read it. The board is recommending the projects committee of access to the $902,380 budgeted for fiscal year 22 to 23 for the Faywell project. Funds will be used for completion of the plan, permitting purchase and transport of the ladder and ladder placement. A motion to approve the access and use of the $902,380 by the projects committee is required. So once again, this does not give staff authorization to spend the money. It simply means that the, the projects committee will be signing off at each stage, uh, at each step on this. Um, so they will have a more detailed review of what this project would look like before they obviously release the funds at each step of this, uh, step of this process. Thank you, Stephen. That, that's a very uh, thorough explanation of what we're voting on, I think. I'll give a minute just to see if there are any questions, um, and then we'll entertain a, a motion in a second. So the, the board has discussed this, um, and it is a recommendation from the board. Uh, we've been talking about this project for a long, very long time, uh, designed as by V3 and, and Interflu to get to this point and understanding, along with DK Riverfish, um, that this is a very promising fix to fish passage at the dam. Um, I'm not seeing any questions, so I will entertain a motion in a second. Uh, Jennifer Hammer making the motion and Larry Cox making the second. So we have the vote. Okay, the motion has passed with three abstentions. Hey, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Um, so with that, then we're going to jump into our second uh, uh, big um, dam management project, which is the Growing Mill Dam, and I'm going to hand that over to Dina. Okay, I'm going to give you the highlights. There's all the details are within the agenda that you can read, and if you'd like to discuss, you can always just give me a call or send me an email. Um, but some of the highlights that I just want to make sure that everyone is on board with um, and knowing that we're what's going on in case they hear is that there has been an amended listing to the historical registry for the Growy Mill um, listing on the National Historical Register um, by the Park Service. And that was done by the Growy Mill Association. They submitted some additional documentation. So if you were to go to the mill, to the MPS site, actually, as of right now, you'll find the original listing that was done um, way back when, I don't know that, I can't remember that exact date offhand. And they they worked with the local historian to um, provide some additional documentation that described more in detail about the mill and the property, including like the dam and the impoundment. Um, per our consultants is that this doesn't actually change the listing, like it doesn't expand, it's not considered an expansion on the listing or even a change of listing, it's just updating some of the documentation and text that go with that listing. It doesn't change our process at all, we're still following the same requirements that we had given the old documentation are the exact same requirements we have under the new documentation in terms of our process getting the project permitted. But in case you hear that the dam is now listed and we cannot remove it, that's not 100% true. <laughs> um, things like that. So um, that that had been done and um, the I have copies of the new documentation if you'd like to see it. Last I checked a couple of weeks ago, it still shows up as pending on the National Historic on the National Park Service site. So they're still getting caught up on uploading all the new records that they made the changes um, over time. The main thing we have going on with the project right now is permitting. Um, you guys were great. And I appreciate everyone that responded to our call of action via an email following the board meeting last time to get some additional funds um, to keep our permitting as we transition from the nationwide permit into the IP process, individual permit process with the Corps of Engineers keeping that rolling. So kind of summarizing where we are with all of our permits, um, with the Corps of Engineers permit, there's two permits sort of involved with the Corps of Engineers. Um, the first is the 404, um, or the 404 permit, which is the wetlands, what you got, guys have all kind of known as the wetlands permit, that transition from the nationwide permit to an individual permit early in August. And so we're working on getting all those requirements met and work on that. Um, it doesn't change a lot on our end, it just maybe extends that timeline a little bit. Um, nationwide 
individual permits require public outreach and a little bit of additional review and additional work um, by the staff at the core um, that's not part of the nationwide permit. So it is going to slow down when we get that permit, but we are working on that as quickly as we can with our consultant team. The core is also doing the section 106, a lot of numbers, but that's how they're called. They don't, they don't really have other titles, but the section 106 is our is the historical permit because the dam is, is adjacent to or near the Growing Mill, which is a historical registered building, as well as all of the Fullersburg Woods being part of work done by the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, um, you know, back in the 30s. Um, it does need to go through this section 106 review process. Um, that was one of the things that was included in the email to you guys. So as part of that, we're doing a lot of outreach with interested stakeholders from the historical societies to um, Indian tribes that have inhabited the area um, to other parties that have a stake in the interest on that historical side of things. Um, one of the requirements of that is that we do need to do a phase one archeological survey as well as a phase one historical property survey for the project. You guys were great and got that money approved to me very quickly by email. And instead of having to wait to this meeting to initiate that contract, the University of Illinois Urban and Champaign's already been working on that for two weeks and they're getting ready and they've been, you know, putting all their staff getting that to us. So we're, you know, two weeks further into this six week process than we would have been if you guys wouldn't have graciously voted by email for me. Um, we did have a couple meetings um, with various stakeholders on for that 106. And those are all summarized in the agenda if you want to get caught up on those details. We will continue to have meetings um, with them once this phase one assessments are complete. And then the goal of this process is to come up with some mitigation measures to the historical things. Things like recognize possibly signage um, in, in you know, future programming at the site, you know, things that would be able to document so that people when they come back, they would know that the CCC was involved in this structure that had been removed. And we're still working on all those details. Other permits we have out there are obviously we have three permit applications in with DuPage County. We have received comments back on all of those permits. So that's building and zoning, um, DUDOT, as well as DuPage County stormwater management. And we are working on addressing those comments, revising plans, getting additional details and documentations to them. Um, we're be working through that. Other permits are Kane DuPage Soil and Water Conservation District has gotten us comments back and IDNR OWR on the dam removals has gotten us comments back. So we're way involved in permitting and getting all those permit applications and all those is issues addressed. Some, most of the concerns seem to be just sort of looking at things from a slightly different way. And we're um, definitely working through those and keeping that permitting on um, task. Um, MWRD has also completed their 98, their review of the 98% plans and specs and Hay and um, us in the Forest Preserve are working on addressing their concerns and keeping um, that up to date. The big delay and the big unknown of when it, the project will go to bid is all coming down to permitting. Um, how long will this IP process take um, with the core? And then another process gets involved with the IEPA through the 401 certification because we will require it to get an individual 401 cert from the IE, IEPA. And we're working on that as fast as we can and putting all of our efforts towards that. So I don't have a date for you because I'm sort of at the review of regulators. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't it feel good? <laughs> uh, thank you, Dina. Yeah, and obviously, you know, it's an enormous effort from staff uh, keeping, you know, that project moving forward. Obviously, once again, uh, just critical to the ecology of, uh, of Salt Creek. Um, excellent. Okay, let's keep, uh, let's keep moving along. Um, next project up is, oh, and just one last thing, but once again, you know, MWRD uh, looking at funding the totality of that project. Um, just been excellent partner in helping, um, you know, pull all the component pieces necessary to get a project like that uh, together. So thanks to them. Um, next thing, uh, Springbrook phase two. This is a project that we're in the uh, evaluation phase of. Just a noting there that we did have a, a report from our monitoring team that there was uh, very high pHs, uh, acidic pHs uh, observed or found at the site and also um, uh, they noted a chlorine smell. Um, so we immediately contacted all our partners in the area. That includes uh, Wheaton Sanitary District, also uh, the Forest Preserve is the owner, and also um, County Stormwater Management. Uh, we uh, looked through all the notes, and what we concluded, in fact, was that it appears that it was benthic, um, benthic algae that was pushing uh, just the DO cycle. Um, at certain points, they're putting out a lot of um, carbon dioxide, 
And that's what was causing the high pHs. And it was largely based, Alex and our staff and I walked that intersection and it appears that it's large, it's completely within the footprint of the old um, uh, pool there where the, where the dam come out. So it's the old um, footprint of that. Um, and we'll look in some topo maps just to confirm that ob observation, but kind of goes back to some of the stuff like Andrew was talking about earlier today that, you know, that it may be, um, you know, built up nutrients over time in that area, but also perhaps an, a built up seed bank of, uh, of algae, et cetera, in the bottom of that pool. And we're seeing some of that come to the surface. A bit speculative at the moment, but an interesting, interesting problem, uh, certainly uh, to deal with. Moving on to the next bullet, Southern East Branch Stream Enhancement Project. As you know, that project is um, that's currently on hold as Army Corps have um, told us that it, it has been added to their uh, list for consideration for funding out in, our, um, uh, in uh, next year. So we're, we're waiting for a notification of them to see if that, that is all confirmed. Obviously that would allow that project to uh, sort of grow in scale considerably and allow us to keep our, our funds available for adding to it. Uh, next project is the Climb Creek uh, Stream Bank Stabilization Project, which is a project that we are um, funding with uh, via our member, Carol Stream. Um, there's, uh, that project is proceeding as planned. And once again, that it's set out there in the, uh, in the details. Uh, moving forward, let's move on to item number seven, uh, Nutrient Implementation Plan. Uh, we had a presentation on this I believe it was at our April uh, meeting um, about the um, the qual modeling, et cetera, which is the really the central central part of this. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But once again, there is that meeting on the 29th for our um, special condition permit holders, where we'll look again in detail at the most updated versions of those models and some of the variants of them that we've uh, we've worked out with Tetra Tech um, to see about if there's more efficient ways for us to hit our ambient. Uh, in-stream goals. Um, there are details set out there in the, in the various um, uh, scenarios that we, we've been looking at. Um, once again, any questions on that, contact Dean or I directly and we'll take you through it. Uh, the other component of this, of course, is non-point source. Um, we did a, uh, had a presentation on that uh, earlier in the year as well. The, um, that particular uh, project, there were still a couple of large agencies uh, who did street sweeping, et cetera, that were not included in it. We, we now have data in from DuPage County DOT as well, and we're working with Illinois Tollway to get theirs in. There's a couple of smaller ones out there, but those are the, the big ones. Those totals are not gonna change the overall uh, input from this that really in these urban areas, reducing total phosphorus in stream is going to be a treatment plant um, specific uh, reduction. Uh, really, the, the target zone that we're looking for for ambient phosphorus is, er, appears to be largely reached even in, our, in areas that are not affected by wastewater affluent. Uh, IPS model update. Um, as you know, that, that report should have been issued already. Ed Rankin, who is the principal author that we're working with at MBI, was obviously seriously ill um, end of last year, beginning of this. It appears he's made a full recovery. And uh, we are, I have a few items on my desk there that I'm penning for that report. And I'm hoping to get that out in the next uh, two weeks that we will have a draft final uh, out for everyone. We will then supply that to our partners as we move into the negotiation phase with them about what are, is going to be the central thrust of our NIP. Obviously that IPS sets out that all, all critical uh, in-stream threshold that is protective of uh, aquatic life. I'm not going to give any uh, additional update on the additional NIP tasks, such as the DO report and the reference site analysis, just to note that staff were out in um, executing on that reference site analysis uh, uh, during the summer. We, we, we have uh, largely finished that, uh, that sampling. Uh, Bios, uh, moving. Dina, anything to add on any of the NIP items? Uh not really, no. I mean, I guess if any, we're going to be on the Qual 2K modeling, we're going to be kind of trans, starting to transition away from the analysis of our phosphorus um, in stream standard and now looking more at sort of the DO and the offensive conditions, aka sustonic and benthic algae evaluations, part of the models um, as we move kind of in the next, kind of the next stage of our NIP analysis using those models. So stay tuned point. for more details on that. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, and what Dean is pointing out is that, you know, in these models, even with, you know, reducing phosphorus that plants die, you know, to, to, to really low levels, the dissolved oxygen, it, it, what the models show is that, that total phosphorus is not the principal driver of, of in-stream dissolved oxygen. It's, it's a factor, but it's not the, the prevailing factor. So we can't solve dissolved oxygen simply by turning off the uh, total phosphorus loading. There are going to have to be physical interventions. And of course, a lot of the projects that we've already put in place um, obviously, Fuller's, removal of Fullersburg will be a huge DO improvement. Um, also, then the, the removal on the West Branch of the Warrenville and uh, McDowell Grove Dam by County Stormwater and Forest Preserve. All of those projects over the last decade, and Churchill Woods, of course, uh, those cumulatively improved dissolved oxygen. So those are projects, if we hadn't have done those, we would now have to, in our NIP, we would have to say, well, let's do those in the future. Um, so, you know, all of those things improved aquatic life, but they also improved um, uh, the, the in-stream conditions uh, for, uh, for dissolved oxygen. Okay, non-permanent activities. Obviously, some of these reports, East, West Branch, and Salt Creek bioassessments also were held up by Ed Rankin's um, illness. Um, we will be having a presentation at our next meeting um, about the, um, I think it's the West Branch bioassessment, because Ed was the one working on the East Branch bioassessment, and he, his illness pushed that back a little bit. But we will be covering uh, that bioassessment, what the outputs from that uh, were and what we find and comparing it to the, producing a trends analysis based on our bioassessments in past years. Uh, all right. Um, monitoring non-bioassessments, uh, nothing really to report there. I'm gonna move on to chlorides at the bottom of page 13. Uh, workshops, obviously we're moving, <laughs> summer's over, we're getting into the, uh, Workshop period. Once again, those workshops are a important item for agency members in order to meet their MS4 permit requirements. They are virtual. Um, we, you know that that we moved to that during COVID. Uh, we got very good response. There, I, I, I will have to gauge in future years what the interest is about moving back to a in-person meeting. There's pros and cons to both approaches, um, but we will again probably be having a smattering of more more technical. Um, in-person ones. We did calibration last year with County DOT. Uh, maybe do another one of those again uh, this year, uh, as well as a couple of items. So stay um, tuned on that. We also are long awaited salt management questionnaire. Um, will be going out prior to the winter as people are gearing up to get that filled in uh, for the previous winter. Uh, thanks again to Itasca, Carol Stream, and Wooddale who are participating in the Street Sweeper study. I think we will be at the point, maybe by our next meeting, where we can start to look at some of the preliminary data findings on that. Um, and I think that that's everything worth reporting on on there. Um, so then moving on into other business. Dina, anything uh, we need from anyone on that Upper Salt Creek plan, if any of the folks that are affected by that plan are on the call? Okay. Um, So uh, one item, and I thought I made notes in it, but apparently I made it in my uh, the minutes section. Um, there is a next week, September 7th, there is an IWEA workshop uh, called Nutrient Removal and, uh, um, and Reuse. It's going to be held as an in-person meeting. It's in the village of Addison at the uh, Shriners Temple. Um, I know um, staff are planning to attend, but any members that are interested in this, obviously, as we move into this NIP item, a lot of the items on the agenda are very pertinent to the development of our NIP. Um, there will be a save the date reminder with a link to registration for that meeting going out just after this uh, after this meeting is wrapped up. It's also in the chat. It's also in the chat. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, business items. Uh, so, yeah, they, so these are invoices. Once again, all of these invoices pass through. They're in. They're budgeted, if not other otherwise noted. But once it's gone, staff reviews with the contractor. Staff approves them to a board member who then reviews staff's work. Then that is then reviewed back to the, the board who then um, sign off on, uh, on the check to, to pay, pay the amount. So there's multiple levels of, of review here and they're given here for your, um, uh, your information. Um, financial reports also attached. Once again, any, any questions about the budget, any of these invoices or the, um, uh, you know, tax returns, that kind of thing. They're all, those are posted on the website. 
uh, you know, please get in contact with me directly and I will go through that uh, items with you. Um, so once again, uh, presentations and workshops covered there. Once again, those presentations and workshops then also get supplied to DuPage County Stormwater, who includes them in the MS4 report for all the surface water management, water uh, and quality uh, sort of um, items that go on um, behind, uh, behind the scenes. Uh, then we've got other work group meetings set out. So actually, in, in the end, actually came in well under time. Um, so <laughs> so I, I skipped over a number of items there, obviously. If anyone has any questions about any of those items, call Dina or I, and we will be only too happy to discuss them with you. All right, there's a lot of information that goes into the uh, agenda. 16 pages uh, for meeting agendas is uh, very detailed. So we're trusting that everyone is receiving your packet, but you're reading through it before the meeting. Uh, if you do have any questions, um, you can enter them right now. Uh, if you think it's for the general membership or uh, just contact Stephen or Dina afterwards. Um, so next meeting, October 26th, nine o'clock. And with that, I don't see any comments in the chat. I think we're ready to entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion by Sue Barrett and second by Joe Slavnik. All right, thank you everyone. We are adjourned and uh, see you in October. Stay healthy. Thanks everyone. Yeah, I, I, I'm getting AT&T out here to look at my connection. About this time, every day, it just uh, kicks me off. So last night, I recycled everything. You know, I, I closed down my laptop, cleaned out my browser, um, you know, did everything to get set up for today, and it still kicked me out. So something is happening between like uh, 9 and 10.30 every day. Uh, and of course, you know, when it happens, then everybody comes running to me. <laughs> you know? can't get online.